So often we hear about artists whose work isn't recognised until long after they're dead. And one of those artists was Joy Hester, whose tumultuous life and artistic career was deeply rooted right here at Heidi Museum of Modern Art. Hello and welcome to Artifacts. My name is Jess Perkins and I'm here with my colleagues and <laughs> acquaintances, Dave Warnicke and Matt Stewart. Hey. I would have said friends, but all right. Well, I thought friends. I was just razzing you, like friends do. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, this is a bit of fun. We are here at the Heidi Museum of Modern Art and we're sitting in front of a piece by an artist who spent a lot of time here at Heidi. This is a piece from the Love series from Joy Hester. Either of you familiar at all with the name Joy Hester, with Heidi in general? I like how the name makes me feel. Yeah. Joy Hester. Okay, Joy Hester. and it makes you feel... Good. Okay, yep. cool. Matt, how does Positive. it make you feel? Um, yeah, also good. Any oh. relation to Paul Hester? Uh, yeah. Wow. I don't think that's true. It's not true, but um, it was fun for a moment, wasn't it? It was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> This, play, this work screams love to me. Yeah. Love I or love one? What's what, what's the... Well, Roman numerals, so you could probably say either, I suppose. L, what's L in Roman numerals? <laughs> love. <laughs> love. L stands for love. Hmm. You ever been so in love that your mouths disappear? Yes. Yeah, me too. No. Yeah, well... <laughs> one day. One day, little buddy. <laughs> So to find out more about Joy Hester and the history of Heidi, I'm here chatting with head curator Kendra Morgan. Thanks so much, Kendra. Can you tell me a little bit about the Love series, one of which is uh, currently on display here? Yes, the Love series is absolutely beautiful. They often show two heads. Often the male head is more shadowy and a darker presence. The female is shown in a lighter, luminescent way. And the two heads often merge, often at the point of the eye. So they are about um, sexual bonding, but also just about intimacy and real deep, deep connection and they were very unusual in Australian art at the time and most explorations of sexuality in art, particularly by women, were about, you know, I guess the female nude or about eroticism in a, in a more overt way mm. and these of course were very personal expressions of Joy Hester's psychological state at the time. I'm going to focus a little bit on the life of Joy Hester as well as the fascinating and deeply intertwined lives of the artists who gathered here at Heidi in the 30s, 40s and 50s. It has a really, really interesting and somewhat complex history here. <laughs> I'm really excited because I can see on your face that there's something. <laughs> Something's happened here. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing, like, nobody's been murdered. I just want to... That's yeah. No, that's what your face is saying. I know, and that's why my Good. voice, in my mouth is now... Uh, see, that that's, they want to tell us that, but they can't. They can't, no mouths. <laughs> <laughs> that's love. I wonder, if, I wonder if there's any ghosts around these halls. Okay, you've you've immediately misunderstood. Um, there's no, nothing like From that. From the murder victims. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> You're going to be so disappointed now. Disappointed? Oh. oh well, no one's murder? The, no one murder? died here. I was promised murder. <laughs> no, so how's this? Because the three of us, we love a great name. Joy St. Clair Hester. Oh, yeah. That's good. That yeah, is right. good. Born in August of 1920 in the Bayside, Elstonwick, Elwood area of Melbourne. She was a student of St. Michael's Grammar School in St. Kilda until the age of 17, at which time she enrolled in commercial art at Brighton Technical School for one year before leaving to attend the National Gallery School in Melbourne. So, yeah, an art education started at a, at a pretty early age. She even won a prize for a life study at the annual students' competition. So she's, you know, she's very talented. While the curriculum was based in very traditional media and practice, Joy took this time to experiment a little bit. She broke free from formal restraints of art education at the time. And her work during this time, though bound by tradition, was concerned with shadow and tonal shading and the relationship between dark and light. In 1938, at the age of 18, Joy Hester met fellow artist Albert Tucker, another pretty good name, Albert Tucker, and lived with him in East Melbourne. And that same year, she was a founding member of the Contemporary Art Society, which was an organisation formed to promote non-representative forms of art. And they sort of had a focus on contemporary styles of art. Say to represent non-representative forms of art. To promote. Okay. <laughs> non-promotional forms of art. Yeah. I mean, I'm still confused, but I love it. It sounds <laughs> awesome. It sounds like a positive move. Yeah. Very important and positive move. So 
The Herald exhibition, which brought British and French artwork to Australia for the first time, happened in 1939. And there was an article published in 2005 that said, the Herald exhibition of 1939 was the most important exhibition ever to come to Australia. Right, wow. I thought you were going to say the most important thing that happened in 1939. <laughs> most important yeah, thing right. that happened in 1939. Would have begged to differ. <laughs> well, when I think of 1939 and world events, mm-hmm. I think of that art exhibition that came to Melbourne. That's right. Yeah, I think it kicked off some pretty <laughs> nasty business after that. But <laughs> You think that's what started everything? Well, yeah, as far as I can tell. Wow. Yeah, I think uh, I think there was another artist who was pretty <laughs> cranky about things after that. Oh, no. Because <laughs> it goes on to say, despite obvious lacks and omissions, no German expressionists, yes. no Russian constructivists. Yeah, he was furious. <laughs> no, <laughs> <and> furious. <laughs> what about an Austrian <laughs> impressionist? <laughs> <laughs> no, <sighs> no Italian futurists and few surrealists. It brought the modern movement with a bang to the doorstep of Australia as nothing else had. Yeah. So it was big. It was huge. Not a lot of people know that Mussolini was an Italian <laughs> futurist. <laughs> Did not think when researching that this is where we would go. But, I mean, that's, that's the joy of artefacts, isn't it? That's the joy Hester. Yeah. <laughs> it was also where Joy Hester met Melbourne-based art patron Sunday Reed. Oh my God, what a name. Incredible, right? <laughs> Sunday, shit. just Sunday as a first name is incredible. Yeah. And then Sunday Reed, just... Yeah. With an just E or a Y on the end? Y, like the, okay. like the day of the week. Okay, not a chocolate sundae. No. <laughs> no, not, a, not an okay, ice cream it's, sundae. It's still cool though. I'm picturing you, yeah, sitting out in the park, having a Sunday Reed. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> okay, That's yep, yep. nice. Beautiful. That is beautiful. So Sunday and her husband, John Reed, were prominent art benefactors of the time and had purchased a former dairy farm a few years earlier and had turned it into a place for like-minded art lovers to retreat, create and connect. And that's where we are today. We're sitting in an old dairy farm. Well, so the, maybe the, f- the ghosts are going to be cows. <laughs> Moo! <laughs> Moo! Imagine. <laughs> Imagine. We're in a really, like, nice... Yeah. Fancy art place. I agree, and I think it feels feels right. It does feels feel a right bit like this. <laughs> it also makes sense that they insist that we do this before they open the gate. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody. No one can walk in on Matt going. Ooh. <laughs> but I, I, we, I mean, we just heard that um, they were driving past. And it was an old, rundown dairy farm, and it cost a grand. Yeah, that's right. This. Yeah, Isn't yeah. That yeah. wild. We, we were just told when we got here that it cost them a thousand pound. I mean, inflation and whatnot, yeah, but it was the still. 30s, yeah, for, but it's like 15 acres for a thousand pounds. Yeah. It's wild. So they named their property Heidi after the nearby suburb of Heidelberg. And also, I think, as a reference to the Heidelberg School, which was an Australian art movement of the late 19th century. Ah, Frederick McCubbin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And his gang of ne'er do wells. <laughs> All doing their little art. Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> so Heidi became a real focal point for progressive art and culture. As the Reeds opened their home to artists like Sidney Nolan, Albert Tucker and Joy Hester were here, John Percival, many, many more. In fact, Sidney Nolan, while living at Heidi on and off for almost a decade, painted his famous Ned Kelly series in the Heidi dining room between 46 and 47. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> between lunch and dinner. Between lunch and dinner. Well, because otherwise the dining room was being yeah, used course. and it would be pretty rude to take up the whole dining table, you know? So, Because <laughs> there's many, many in that series, right? Would... Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's several of them. I can't remember the exact number, but there's a lot of them. And that, that's like one of the iconic mm. Australian art things. <laughs> Could not have said it better. So well said. God, we're the right people to do this series. <laughs> yeah. We picked up a lot of the, the jargon. Yeah. <laughs> Are the maisons saints? Oh, yeah. I don't know what that means. That's, that's not the right. What does that mean? That word. You I position. Position. Composition. Composition. It's what's happening in front of the camera. Yeah. Which I, for, uh, I is us right that. now. I stand by that. We are the mid <laughs> So Joy had found a great friend in Sunday Read and a place to work and collaborate with other artists. And this loose grouping of artists became known as the Heidi Circle. I've, uh, yeah, loose group, eh? Is that, are you foreshadowing there? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The wider community probably thought, 
everything going on at Heidi was very bohemian. We do still have visitors come to the museum who tell us that they lived locally and their parents said, do not go near that property. They bathe naked <laughs> in the sun and they, you know, swim naked in the river. And it was very, um, I don't know, communal in, in, in its and kind of, you know, intensity and the way they conducted their lives. So I think the local community found them a little unusual for the time, which is, you know, the 1930s and 40s. So there were artists who lived and worked at Heidi and included many of Australia's best known modernist painters. So I guess, yeah, Sunday and John Reid just really good at bringing people together and, and creating a space for them to... And do they make art themselves? They just like making other people making the art? Um, they, yeah, I think they just, they, they wanted to support um, artists while they were making art. I think it, there's some works that, you know, Sunday said she helped with and, and stuff like that, but I think it was more just... Clean the paintbrushes. Clean the paintbrushes, yeah. Um, standing next to the artist while they're painting and going... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is so good. That, that was, was such a good stroke. I should use a bit of green. Yeah, that yeah. sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. That's well, they good. are using green. Yeah. And then she'd go, yeah, yeah great yeah. choice. You great choice. That. Yeah. That's just a, just a really good hype woman. Yeah. yeah. Which I think we all need. You know? So these artists led really fascinating and dramatic lives while they were living and working at Heidi, so much so that they're the subject of books, articles, podcasts, including a book called Modern Love, The Lives of John and Sunday Reed, which was written by the current head curator, Kendra Morgan, and artistic director, Leslie Harding. It was released in 2015. And about the book, Emily Biddo wrote for the Sydney Morning Herald, the Reeds are revealed as hugely influential figures in the development of Australian art and intellectual culture. They offered significant financial support and intellectual mentorship to countless artists and they were unflagging advocates of artistic freedom of expression, going as far as paying the legal fees of a number of artists and writers who had charges of obscenity brought against them. Yet, as with many patrons, John and Sunday expected something in return for their largesse, fun word. They depended on the circle for a sense of creative vitality. In a particularly harsh assessment, Albert Tucker described the Reeds as bored rich people looking for outlets. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess, yeah, like, I mean, you're asking, what did they do? They, they were wealthy, sort they of. Had a thousand pounds. They had a thousand pounds. On them, as they drove past, <laughs> I assume. Cash. I love that, thank you. That's, I feel like if I could be anything, I'd love to be a bored rich person. Oh, yeah, that's the dream. Yeah. I mean, Albert Tucker saying it is like a little bit of a, an insult. but no, like... I didn't take it that way. <laughs> <laughs> bored rich people. They became your heroes. Yeah, holy shit. Because, I mean, that just, that implies that they weren't, they weren't stressed. <laughs> they weren't worried. They were bored. Yeah. They're just paying other people's legal fees. Oh, the best. Yeah. So good. So, yeah, there, there was some, they were paying legal fees because of obscenities. Yeah. Is that that famous Sydney knowing painting that just was... Said fuck, <laughs> <laughs> and some people didn't like it. Yeah. It was Ned Kelly, just with the helmet on. Everything else, yeah. <laughs> full nude, full, full, nude. full frontal, yeah, yeah, yeah. shop hanging out. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the helmet was that sort of Nolan style, the very modernist, but the rest was very realistic. Oh, yeah, <laughs> a, little, <laughs> a little too realistic. A little too realistic. Real. See every single pubis. <laughs> <laughs> that no, that's not pubic hair. <laughs> pubis is a, a bone. You could see every single way he had done multiple, of, multiple <laughs> bones. Everybody has multiple bones. Are you one big bone? <laughs> it sounds like he had an extra one. <laughs> I don't think... You should get that checked. I saw somebody else describe it as, if you were going to be a part of Heidi, then it was almost expected that Sunday was going to be a very involved part of your, not just professional life, but also your personal life. There were affairs aplenty at Heidi as well. <laughs> um, the most tumultuous affair was between Sunday Reed and Sidney Nolan. Um, and this it lasted quite a while. Apparently ended when, somebody said when Sunday wouldn't leave her husband John for Sidney Nolan, they kind of split up. And then uh, Sidney Nolan married John's sister, Cynthia. And that caused a bit of a rift between all of them as well. So it was, it was a little bit messy. Right, so it's like the, the Fleetwood Mac of Australia. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is like rumours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Finally, and, uh, I get, I get, get it. it. Now you understand? Um, apparently Nolan's Ned Kelly paintings were left here after the sort of fallout. Um, and he wrote to Sunday asking for his Ned Kelly works back, but she instead returned 284 other paintings and drawings and refused to give up, give up the remaining Kellys, partly because she saw the works 
as fundamental to the proposed Heidi Museum of Modern Art, which was always the plan. It was always the plan for them to build an art gallery here. Right. And it wasn't until 77 that she sought to resolve the dispute. Um, she didn't give them back to Nolan directly. Apparently, she just gave them to the NGB. <laughs> Oh, okay. National Gallery of Australia. Somewhere. Now you can look at them if you like. Yeah, you can go visit them if you want. Uh -huh. So like I said, it seems that Heidi was a pretty creative and amazing place for a young artist to be, but it also had an intensity and, and drama all around. And Joy Hester was certainly not immune to that at all. So she and Albert Tucker were married in 1941 and together they had a son, Sweeney, born in 44. And... In a dramatic twist, which would rapidly change the trajectory of Joy's life, in 1947, she was diagnosed with terminal Hodgkin's lymphoma. Doctors told Joy she maybe had a couple of years to live, two years probably. Immediately, apparently, the same day she was diagnosed, she left Albert Tucker and her son and ran off to live in Sydney with fellow Heidi artist Grey Smith. Just left. Right. So betrayed and hurt, Albert Tucker also left Heidi. He left Australia, in fact. He went off to England to, um, to paint there. So Joy and Albert left their son Sweeney in the care of John and Sunday Reed, who eventually adopted Sweeney, raising him as their own. Which is, wow. yeah, all very sudden. And he's a, a toddler at this point. He's about three. Wow, brutal. Mm. One anecdote that I came across was that Sunday was pretty desperate to adopt a child and in the past had broached the subject with, other artist couples in the area just give me your son <laughs> you've got an extra one or yeah funnily enough n nobody had agreed to just oh. you're gonna finish that or give her a child <laughs> in the dining room again you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna finish <laughs> bringing that up because <laughs> i could you want me to do i can do it do you want to add i'll do it so yeah she was particularly delighted apparently to be left in charge of the care for sweeney so hester and smith lived in sydney for a time before returning to victoria first living in upway before settling in Box Hill. And Joy's illness impacted her work dramatically and left an indelible mark, loading it with emotional content. Her cancer diagnosis came in 1947, and by the time she received it, she had really focused her work um, on this idea of psychological expression and intense emotional states and intense physical states. In fact, one of the most interesting things about her work is how she explores how the body feels to the person inhabiting it rather than how it looks or, can, or is externalised or can be emblematised. She spent a year undergoing quite intense radiation treatment, and during that period, she f focused very much on the face as the the key subject for her work. She continued to make art and the face is um, really a kind of an expression of raw feeling. Often she um, really telescoped in on the eyes. Um, one eye in some of these works is externalised looking out to the outward world. The other one is kind of focused internally and it um, very introspectively and they really express her fear of death, her experience of having this radiation treatment where she had a mask over her head and was in a claustrophobic state in the hospital and uh, they are an, an, an absolute you know, milestone I think in the, in the development of Australian art. During this period of the late 40s Hester produced the drawings that became part of her notable Face, Sleep and Love series, which this one is part of the Love series. And her works were exhibited alongside her poetry in 1950 at her first solo show at the Melbourne Book Club Gallery. She had two more solo exhibitions in 55 and 56, but struggled to sell her art. Australian modernists at the time favoured large oil paintings like those of Sidney Nolan, whereas Joy's work was typically smaller in scale. You know, like this one here, it's not gigantic and it's, it's, it's black ink. It's just sort of light and dark shades, not big and colourful. At this time, she failed to garner the same recognition her male peers received. She was dismissed by critics as angst-written, which, I mean, given what was going on in her life, probably justified. Yeah, it's a funny thing to be criticised for as well. Yeah. Like, we are like, all our, our art to be happy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's right. Oh. oh, an angsty artist. Never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> not for me. Thank you. Yeah, it's not worthwhile. A bit negative. Yeah. <laughs> it makes me feel, and I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> she had the Love series. There was also the Lovers series, which was later. Um, and it was indicative of her maturing and expressive style. She also published poetry and used her drawings to illustrate her words. Now but you those might... poems were happy and <laughs> rhymed. I hope even if the Limericks, art was a bit, a bit angsty, the poetry was very happy. Yeah, great. And that juxtaposition, <laughs> <laughs> that's the real art. Um, so you might be thinking, hang on, she's having exhibitions eight years after she was told she had two years to live. 
she lived a bit longer than the two years the doctors had originally prescribed. Joy and Grace Smith actually had a couple of children together as well, a son, Peregrine, in 1951, and a daughter, Fern, in uh, 54. Strong art names. Really yeah. good names. But was Sunday Read like, um, <laughs> couple more? Yeah, I'll take them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take them if you want. After an extended period in remission, Joy Hester suffered a relapse of Hodgkin's lymphoma in 56, passing away another four years after that in December of 1960 at the age of 40 which is really sad, but lived 13 years, 12, 13 years longer than the than they had said. Right, and I she, believe she was only 40. No, yeah. Got and a lot it, done. Yeah, and have you, she hadn't lived that, she did all the, the exhibitions post-diagnosis. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So. Yeah, so she was working a lot through her illness and, and yeah, um, exhibiting her work. Like I said, not getting the recognition of her male peers, but... Um, yeah, she she will get the recognition. So like many female artists of the time, uh, she wasn't celebrated or properly recognised during her lifetime. However, after her death, a few people, including her first husband, Albert Tucker, worked tirelessly to make sure her career and her art was recognised by the press, by art galleries and by the wider art community. And through the effort of her peers, she's now recognised as having produced some of the most distinctive and intriguing imagery to emerge in Australia in the 40s and 50s. So huge. John and Sunday Reed organised a commemorative exhibition of her work in 1963. I read in one article that her son Sweeney curated a show of her work at one point as well. And there was an exhibition here a couple of years ago at Heidi that was the Joy Hester Remember Me exhibition. And it really demonstrated her range, uh, the range of her skill, I guess, and how her work changed dramatically through her life and career. Um, and there's a little quote from that saying, she really moved a long way from her early years in the late 1930s, from a naturalistic to a far more expressive and subjective mode of art making. And reviewing her work for Time in 2001, Michael Fitzgerald wrote, 41 years after her death, Hester's drawings still suck the oxygen from the air, providing some of the clearest eyed images in Australian art. Yeah, a bit angsty for me. <laughs> Sounds like they kill people. Yeah, they suck the oxygen from the air. <laughs> And we need that to live. So she, so people have gotten bored in later years. Yeah. So that's the, the brutal story here a lot, a lot with artists. Yeah. Don't get the respect until after they die. I know, yeah. And, yeah, sadly she she did die quite young and so didn't, uh, didn't get the recognition during her lifetime but is uh, deeply respected and admired now. It feels like the critics at the time were doing like an old school version of give us a smile. Hey, <laughs> can you make your paintings have a little smile? You don't even have mouths yeah. on them. Give them a smile. Sweetheart. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe it has a little bit of that. It was definitely, yeah, unfortunately, misogyny played a part for sure. What? Um, I know. As a feminist, that I know that is, is deeply real, offensive to you. Yeah, yeah, that's a real turn off to me. Misogyny, yeah. I hate it. <laughs> Can't stand it. For 1950, these images of um, that really legitimised the idea that um, psychological experience was a, um, a valid subject for creative expression. You know that that was just beyond most of the critics' um, rec you know recognition. They didn't know how to understand it. Um, but also, she tackled subjects that were very female centric. You know, she did look at love, birth, death, um, the experience of motherhood, and uh, she also drew rather than painted, and drawing was considered a secondary medium. So the critics just couldn't take her seriously. She wasn't considered a serious artist. Would you say she was sort of ahead of her time? Absolutely ahead of her time. I mean, just the fact that, you know, we all now accept drawing as an autonomous means of expression, but in the 1930s when she started out, it was very much considered um, a medium that you worked in uh, preliminary to creating a painting or a sculpture. And she found drawing very immediate. It presented no barrier to kind of her interior vision. And she stuck with that. It's such an interesting place that we're in now and like yeah Joy Hester's work is amazing and her experiences here but the whole sort of community and John and Sunday Reid it's um a yeah. pretty fascinating place. Maybe it's, there's no literal ghosts but it feels like the spirit of this loose group of individuals <laughs> still permeates mm. through these walls and halls. Do you still visit the dining room? No. No. You can't. <laughs> Where are you looking for a kid? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody got a kid? Kid up for grabs? Have you have you visited Heidi before? No. 
my, I'm, my first time. I've been here a few times and today's the first time I realised mm. it's called Heidi, not Hyde. Mm. And I've said that to people. Just going down to Hyde today. Yeah. And people have P played, not, a, <laughs> played along. <laughs> they oh, have yeah. not Ooh. pulled me up on it. And once again, proving we are the right people to be doing <laughs> this art-based series. And I've said it to all sorts of people, like, uh, you know, famous artists. I couldn't think of a single one. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, <laughs> proving. <laughs> Leonardo DiCaprio. You know. Said it to DiCaprio, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Please, leave me alone. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you should come down to Heidi. There's lots of uh, permanent exhibitions. They also do mm. uh, temporary ones. Yep. It's, yeah. It's just cool to hang out in a place that's so important in Australian art history. Yeah. And can I say this? World art history. Whoa. I'm going to say it. There's been so many points where we could have ended, so I think Well, they can do that fine. later. No, that's what I mean. So we won't have good. to do that now. No, 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 You're okay. not doing a we'll live do edit, are you? Yeah, we do it in camera. <laughs> you do it in camera? Yeah, yeah, With yeah. scissors. Great. <laughs> so we're sitting here in front of Joy, one of Joy Hester's uh, pieces from the Love series. Thoughts, opinions, feelings. What do you think? Uh, I, I like it. Um, I like uh, what's going on there. I like how one of them's chin, chin is up. <laughs> Keep your chin up. Okay. You know, keep your chin up. Yeah. That's not angsty to me. That's stoic. Yeah. And uh, this one's got a very long neck. Long neck. I love a long neck. Yeah. <laughs> love, love a couple of long, long necks. Neck. But I know I, th I, I, I think it, it definitely feels like something's going on there, and I love that. What do you think that something is? Passion. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I feel it's kind. Of, you know, it's it's making me feel <laughs> excited. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think I maybe want you to stop talking about what you think about the art. I'd love to give Dave a go. And maybe you give you a time out. It's rare that art makes me horny, but... <laughs> it's not rare. <laughs> it's not rare. <laughs> it's quite not rare. easy, actually. Yeah. I love it. I feel lucky that we've looked, or fortunate that we've looked at it for so long. Yeah. Because when we, we walked in here, it's quite a small, unassuming piece. Yeah. And I feel like often you walk into a gallery, you go, oh, fantastic. Yeah, I'll look at that for a few seconds. Fantastic. Move on. Yeah. Because there's so many things on offer, because we, I've been looking at it for so long. The yeah. more I look at it, the more intriguing I find it. Yeah, I agree. I'm finding more things. Are these eyes? I'm really focusing ears? on the hand yeah. as well, because like the, there's there's no details in the face. Even the yeah, the eyes are sort of just sort of scratched sort of lines, but the hand is quite detailed and and you were trying to replicate the position the hand is in as well. Trying and nailing it. It's on a shoulder or something, you know. Bit of this. Yeah. I I really like it. I think you're absolutely right. It's nice to sort of actually have a chance to properly look at it and spend some time looking at it. And the more I'm looking at it, the more I'm liking it. Yeah, I'm going to make an offer. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to make an offer on this one. Doesn't have a you price. A, you got a thousand pounds? Thousand pounds? Yeah. The bargain. I imagine <laughs> that is pretty cheap. So. <laughs> oh, I'm talking in 1934. Oh, okay. You got equivalent cash now? No. You got a few mil? <laughs>